One of the most complex parts of a QRP transceiver to build, especially if making it from scratch, is the transmit power amplifier chain. You are amplifying a signal from a few milliwatts up to at least several watts. And a lot of things can go wrong. For instance, self oscillation, overheating, parasitic oscillations and more. This is a 40 meter QRP rig which had a great receiver but took many months to build and get the transmitter right. I think I'm on the right track thanks to a circuit from the NorCal Sierra which was featured in the ARRL handbook in 2000. If you don't have a handbook of that year, the circuit is also freely available from the ARRL website. For that reason, and the fact that the NorCal Sierra operated from 80 to 15 metres, makes its driver and power amplifier circuit useful if you are designing a QRP rig yourself. I tried many circuits over the last few months, and unlike all the others, this one worked first time. The NorCal Sierra is a SuperHet CW transceiver. It's multi-band, able to operate on all bands from 80 to 15 metres. But to simplify things, it uses plug-in band modules. It's based on the NE602, which provides adequate but not exceptional performance. However, a big advantage is low receive current consumption, which makes it ideal for portable use. In its design, this rig may well have been the predecessor of some of the early Ellicraft rigs. I'll just go through some of the important stages in the transmitter section. This is the transmit mixer using an NE602 and in their case a 4.915 meg crystal. The bandpass filter which cleans up the signal. A buffer amplifier which I used an MPF102. And the driver which comprises a 2N222. Now the keying in their case, if we have a look a bit further along, that's the key socket. The keying is done here by shorting the emitter circuit to ground via diode and resistors. I did it a bit differently because I already had a keyed circuit which provided a keyed 12 volt supply rail. I didn't need any of that. I just had a low value resistor going from emitter to ground and then keyed the supply rail. Then in the collector circuit is a broadband ferrite transformer. And finally, the power amplifier stage. They used a 2N3553, but that particular transistor is very good, but not particularly easy or cheap to get. Then there's the low pass filter and the antenna connection. I've made quite a few changes, which I'll now show in this diagram. This is the transmit mixer in my rig using an NE602. The crystal frequency is 4.032, which is the IF. That mixes very neatly with 11.059, which is the VXO. And if you take the difference between those frequencies, then it covers a useful part of the 40 meter CW segment. This inductor in series with the crystal brings the frequency low. You need to do that so that you get a transmit receive offset. You want the receive to be about 800 Hertz above the transmit. Some other parts of the circuit handle the keying. This is 12 volts keyed, a 9.1 volt Zener. 9.1 volts is too high for the NE602 transmit mixer. So I've just put a couple of diodes in series one in 4148s and they drop the voltage by about 0.7 of a volt individually. So that's down around 7.5 to 8 volts, which is okay for the NE602. The bandpass filter, as a rough rule of thumb, about 5 microhenries and 100 picofarad will resonate on 7 megahertz. 
I've got some trimmer capacitors here that are unmarked but anything that goes from about 10 to 100 picofarads should be okay in this part of the circuit. Next we have a FET amplifier. It's high impedance so it doesn't load the preceding filter too much. And through the source that drives the 2N222. I've actually used a 2N222A which is the metal version. And a broadband transformer here. It's 12 turns of enameled copper wire wrapped around a ferrite transformer used in TV antenna balance and supplied to this is 12 volts which is on transmit but it's not keyed that comes from the transmit receive relay over here on the far right are three BD139s they're connected in parallel if you have problems with one of them overheating then I would suggest putting in emitter resistors Start off with say one ohm in each, that provides more even current between the transistors. I haven't found that necessary though in this particular rig. Another thing is if you do get parasitic oscillations, you can either put ferrite beads on the base connection on each transistor, and or you can connect a low value resistor across from the base to the ground. It could be anywhere from 10 to 100 ohms that will drop the drive to it and might make it more stable but I haven't found that necessary in this particular rig. I should point out again is this particular circuit has been very easy, very well behaved and very stable. Unlike other circuits I tried I spent months and months of not achieving very much at all but this particular one gives about 3 watts output which I'm quite happy with. By the way, when I had one of these transistors in, the output was a touch below 1.5 watts. When I had two in, it was about three watts, just a little bit below. And with three, that didn't increase the output power much more. Um, it was still about three to three and a half watts. But having the three means I think each transistor is working a little bit less hard and so I've not needed to fit heat sinks on them. But if you were driving it a bit harder so that you're getting say two watts per transistor or you're using it in continuous duty cycle modes like Whisper, then I would strongly suggest putting heat sinks on these transistors. In the collector circuit is an RF choke. I think it's about 30 microhenry or something. It's just a lot of turns of wire on a ferrite toroid. More details in the Sierra circuit on the ARRL website. You can't see it very well, but here's the transmit receive relay and this is the low pass filter. Now here's just a hint, let's supposing you've got a transceiver your commercially made rig, which should have a clean RF output, and you transmit a carrier, and you've got the SWR as one-to-one. -one. You then connect up your home brew rig, you press the key, look at the SWR, and it's much worse than one-to-one. -one. one possibility is your home brew rig could be putting out harmonics, in which case the SWR won't be one-to-one -one on those spurious frequencies, or there could be some sort of spurious oscillation going on, which would have a similar effect. In this case, as you can see, the SWR needle hardly moves, which likely indicates, although it's not as good as a spectrum analyzer or similar, but it does indicate that the output would be fairly clean. The other thing that is a good idea doing is pressing the key, varying the frequency, and listening to the effects in a nearby receiver. If you hear various plops and things as you tune around, that means that your rig probably has birdies, spurious outputs, or similar, and you really need to do something about that. Key down, but I've moved the frequency, and on the receiver. No indication on the S meter, 
but you can just hear a bit of broadband noise but it's very low down so it won't really be a problem. So just to summarize if you're looking for a simple power amplifier driver stage for a QRP transmitter you're developing I think a circuit like this is pretty good. It's based on a reputable design the NorCal Sierra that's been built in its hundreds if not thousands. If you want to build a full QRP transceiver and need more information than which I've provided, I definitely recommend going to the AWRL website and having a look at the article on the NorCal Sierra. It's very detailed. There's the circuit, parts list, and some other information. If you want to make the most of low power amateur radio, you need my ebook, Minimum QRP. It's available for under $5 US via Amazon. Or if you're more into antennas, check out hand-carried QRP antennas. Again via Amazon and again under $5. You can find out more about both those titles by searching them in Amazon or going to my website vk3ye.com.